Hello Booktube. I've got a lovely little poem to read you today on this beautiful, beautiful Monday. A little window of beauty here on the eastern coast of the United States of America. There's a blob, a big green swirling blob of stuff uh, that is moving right now past the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes and that I think is coming to Boston. I'm pretty sure that th today and maybe tomorrow will be open windows, but I think that precipitation will be here by the end of the week and I think it will be rain, quite a bit of rain. <laughs> so I've been taking advantage of it today. The day is absolutely beautiful. Again, the type of thing that sits perfectly in the median between uh, winter and, and early spring. Uh, I myself would prefer that it be, uh, well, if I remember the temperature correctly, I prefer that it be 37 degrees hotter than it is today. But I'll take this, absolutely, especially since I have a little dog who's prone to overheating and not admitting that. <laughs> so, so I'll take what I can get until the heat arrives, which ought to be sometime next week. Uh, but for our poem today, I thought that we would go back to our despised stepchild of an anthology. We don't have many anthologies that we're using for our daily poetry here. We, I have I have just a handful of them. The next time uh, one crosses my path at the Brattle Bookshop or at a thrift shop somewhere in Boston uh, that I like, that I like the look of, uh, then I will, I, I'm being very selective. I'll be very careful, but I'll add it. Absolutely. But one of them came to me in the mail. I don't get many poetry anthologies in the mail, but I got one in the mail uh, last year. I've got one so far this year, The Heart of American Poetry, edited by Edward Hirsch. Uh, that we haven't got to yet much on this channel. But uh, last year I got this, the FSG Poetry Anthology. Uh, a naked hardcover in your bookstores. This should still be out. I, I don't think that its its window has closed. And this is edited by Robert Galassi and Robin Cresswell. Uh, and I found a poem in here. We haven't always succeeded with poems that we find in this volume. But I found one that is a trifle. I mean, it's from 1968. It's from Louise Bogan. And I think it's a, you'd probably agree with me that it's a trifle. It's not trying to do anything big. But that might be uh, its greatest strength. This is simply called Night. Uh, the cold, remote islands and the blue estuaries where what breathes, breathes the restless wind of the inlets. What drinks, drinks the incoming tide. Where shell and weed wait upon the salt wash of the sea. And the clear nights of stars swing their lights westward to set behind the land. Where the pulse clinging to the rocks renews itself forever where, again, on cloudless nights, the water reflects the firmament's partial setting. Oh, remember in your ha narrowing dark hours that more things move than blood in the heart. Uh, which is, is the, the strength that I'm talking about here is a strength that we've commented on before. In fact, we saw a poem like this by Seamus Heaney just recently that also meditated on a single moment, a single indrawn breath of air at night in a semi-wild place. And that kind of experience, that kind of moment is almost intangible. It almost doesn't happen at all. And I love it when poetry catches that kind of thing, whether it's interactions between human beings, a particular fleeting nuance that's there and then gone so, for, so quick you almost think you imagine it, to little natural moments like this. I like it when poetry does that. It's very hard for any other kind of artwork to do that, <laughs> but poetry can do it. And I think it does work here, although uh, I question... I know this is dumb and very barbarian of me, but I question the grammar of the thing. The, the first whole stanza, the second whole stanza, and the third whole stanza are clauses. They're, they're descriptive clauses. They are setting the scene for a predicate in what is going to be one enormously long sentence. They're setting the scene for a predicate, for a verb. These things, something. And instead, we don't get that part. Now, that's probably Louise Bogan doing that intentionally, but it's a little jarring. Maybe that was her intention. We get the setting, the cold, remote islands, where the shell and weed wait upon the salt wash of the sea, where the pulse clinging to the rocks renews itself forever. You keep expecting, okay, what about these places? The, you can't just invoke places and have it be coherent English. It can still be coherent poetry. But it can't be coherent English unless you're going to say, okay, what about these places. What do these places do? What do they inspire? Some, they have to, there has to be a verb, and there isn't. Instead, right when you expect it to happen, the final stanza is an invocation. It starts, O oh, remember, and the O oh, is just the letter O. Oh. It is speaking directly to someone. It's speaking to the audience. It's in the vocative. Uh, saying, O oh, remember. 
which you think would come only after a stanza in which we're told what all of these things do. But in the, the Oh Remember, the Oh Remember stanza is, Oh Remember in your narrowing dark hours that more things move than blood in the heart. That is the, the narrator of the poem urging you to remember these silent eternities, these things that are going on and moving and having their being far away from your petty daily concerns. And that maybe there's a, a comfort to be taken from that? I don't know. Maybe there's a solace to be taken from that? I don't know, because that is the missing stanza. That's the stanza that has the verb. <laughs> These things do something. And then once we're told what they do, we get, oh, remember. Then we get the invocation at the end. But instead, that part is removed. Uh, again, I have to believe that it's Louise Bogan's intention to do that. I think it's very interesting. I don't think the poem very much suffers from it, from the absence of that, I, do you? I mean, do you get the point? I mean, if we've got three long stanzas of these beautiful natural things that are mindless and that go on all the time, whether you're worried about money or your home or your family or not, if we get all three of those stanzas, do we really need a fourth stanza telling us that? Or is that the poet just assuming that we kind of get the point and going straight to the invocation to sort of nail the point home? I don't really know. Uh, I don't know anything at all about this poet, for instance. I'm not sure that that would help, but it couldn't hurt, and I don't know anything about the poet. But, so I can't say for sure if this is a tick, if this happens often. I kind of like the poem anyway. Uh, I think the, the title, Night, is kind of dumb, and there ought to be a moratorium. Nothing ever should be called Night or Reckoning or anything. You know, the, the, small, the small list of titles that should never be used for anything anymore because they've been so overused, but I kind of liked it, which puts a win in the column for the FSG anthology. That's a, that's a kind of a win. We can take that so that this poor bedraggled anthology isn't always on the losing end, always on the, on the receiving end of a rant. Uh, so there you go. That is Night by Louise Bogan <laughs> for our poetry on Monday. Uh, and we'll move on to something different tomorrow. I'll see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.